Hi, everyone. Welcome to Lesson 3, A Culture in Need. It's from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. It is fascinating to look at the Roman culture at the time that Paul would have been there or would have been writing to it. Uh, it's not the Rome that we think of in a lot of the pictures with the huge elaborate Colosseums. Those were actually built after Paul Paul had died. But at the time, the city of Rome was really a city of contrast. Uh, wealthy, poor, powerful uh, servants. It was a time of political unrest, would I guess be the best way to put it. It was a culture that had conquered the Greeks, but the Greek philosophy and some of the Greek sins had actually conquered Rome. And so I want us to look at this passage today and not be too surprised. Paul was deliberate when he wrote this letter. He has barely said hello to the church in Rome and introduced himself and talked about why he was writing. And then it's like he picks up the big stick and starts to swing it. Paul does not get out of the first chapter before he wants to talk about what the greatest hindrance is to the Christian faith. And so, on this third lesson of the letter of Romans, take a deep breath. And remember, we are reading a letter. We stop and start. We study a few verses and then the next week study the next few. It really isn't the best way to read the book of Romans. It is a letter. Paul expected when he wrote this that it would be read from the beginning and would be continuously read until people reached the end of it. So I hope last week, uh, each week, you might consider reading through the entire letter of Romans because it really needs to be seen as a whole and be careful as we do it in bits and pieces, not to allow your theology to develop from a few verses, but instead your theology needs to develop from the totality of the letter. And also remember that he has a scribe who I have come to uh, be very fond of, poor Tertius. I often, when I'm teaching or reading through these passages, picture Paul on his feet, pacing back and forth, preaching, teaching, saying what he wants written. And poor Tertius is there with parchment and a quill and ink trying to get it all down. And so... Uh, at the end of this, we will be grateful for who Tertius is and the contribution he made to this letter. So to review where we've been, Paul has introduced himself to the church. Uh, they are people he knows about but has never met. He has given them his credentials as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, his background as somebody who understood Greek, Hebrew, Roman cultures. And now he's going to tell them why he is writing this letter. Paul states the theme for the book of Romans. It's the last thing we did last week. Romans 1, 16 and 17 is why Paul wanted to write this letter. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The reason Paul is writing the letter to Rome is that he wants them to know how to be righteous and how to live by that faith. 
And so that is our goal as well as we look at this letter. The first thing Paul does is say, here's what's necessary. If you want to be a righteous person, a person who is right with God, he wastes no time in addressing the reasons people are going to be hindered from accepting the gospel message as truth. The thing that hinders the power of God's salvation from being at work in their life. Remember, the gospel is the power, God's power of salvation to all who will believe. And so what keeps people from believing, what keeps people from wanting to receive their salvation in the gospel? And Paul answers that by saying, why does God hate sin? We've often heard people say that. Why does God hate sin? He tells us why. Paul has just said that a righteous person has life and life eternal because of their faith in the gospel message. And the very next verse is the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. Why? It's against the people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. That's Romans 1, 18. He's given us the theme for the book of Romans, the power of the message of salvation, the righteousness of a holy God that can be in us through the power of God's Holy Spirit. And then he says, but yet the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. God hates anything that suppresses the truth of his word because it brings harm to his children. I think of it as this. I've had friends who had children who were addicted to drugs. I've had friends whose children went wrong directions in their life in other ways. I had a son who had cancer. I hate the word cancer as a result. I absolutely hate cancer exists. When I read these verses this time to teach, that's what I thought about. God hates wickedness. He hates what suppresses his truth in the lives of his children, just like I hate cancer impacted my child. He's fine now, but I still hate that word. We hate those things that harm our kids, and God is no different. In our culture today, there's a lot of this, a lot of rewriting of God's truth in order to please people, to make it say what people want it to say. I can tell you as a teacher of God's word for over 30 years, actually almost 40 years now, having taught his word, I can tell you that from Genesis to Revelation, there is nothing that brings about the wrath of God more quickly than the misteaching of his truth. And so with that sober thought in mind. Let's move on with what Paul is teaching. Right after he talks about God's wrath comes Romans 1, 19 through 20. It is actually two of the most important verses in the entire book of Romans. If you like to mark in your Bibles, this is one to highlight. This is one to remember because it answers some important questions people might ask you. People often say, what about the people who've never heard the gospel of Jesus? How can they be saved? Why doesn't everyone go to heaven? Why is there a hell? 
What about the people who've never heard about God? And why does God send people to hell? I often say God doesn't send them there, but there are those that choose to go. Why am I allowed to say that? Because of Romans 1, 19 and 20. This is the truth for every human being born to the face of the planet. Since, Paul writes, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen so that people are without excuse. There is no excuse, Paul says, for not believing in a creator God. Why can he say that? Let me give you an example. I titled this photograph that I took from my place out at the lake. It's from our porch out there. I took this picture one morning as I sat there with my coffee, amazed at the greatness of God. So I call this picture Joy in the Morning. God reveals his invisible qualities. God reveals his greatness through nature. And according to Romans, he has revealed his power. He has revealed his existence to every human being on the planet. It's interesting if you read archeology, span almost every group of people had a belief in a greater power, greater than them. Why is that? It comes from Romans 1, 19 and 20, because what is what should be known about God has been made plain to them. God made it plain through his creation, his invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature is evident if people will just pay attention. But instead, we often Look at what people make instead of God. Why do people lose their way in sin? It's in the next verse. Paul writes, for although they knew God and everyone knows there is a power greater than them in this world, for although they knew that, knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Why? Paul goes on to say, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Welcome to a museum in Rome. The Romans had conquered the Greeks, but all they really did was rename Roman culture for their own. The Greek gods were given Roman names. The idols that were made were remade in the image of Rome. They worshiped their emperors and built statues to them. They thought of their emperors as gods. And so what happens when people value their own ideas, their own creation, their own sense of power, their own sense of self, their own self-confidence that what they believe is right or that what they want to believe is right? They claim to be wise, Paul says, but in doing so, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. And you can go to a museum today and see the birds and the 
really sometimes profane images that they created and then called gods, small g gods. Why does God give people over? This next verse has bothered people, Christian people, for a long time. It is what scripture says. Because they ignored God, because they created false gods, God, therefore, gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Paul says, amen. A love that Paul can't think of sin next to the God he knows without praising the God he knows. It bothers us that God gave them over. It doesn't seem like a loving thing to do, but that's explained in the next verses. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. And I pause here to say something. It is impossible for me to agree with so much of the rhetoric that is being taught in our world today, emphasized, glorified even in our world today. You cannot teach the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and find any example across thousands of years, multiple cultures, every generation, where homosexual acts are treated as anything but shameful, sinful. The Bible says they're detestable. In theology, when something has been true in Genesis and remains true across all the generations of Scripture, through every culture, every growth, every Old Covenant, New Covenant change, never did God change his opinion of this. Paul is right when he describes homosexual relationships as shameful lusts. He says even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves as a result the due penalty for their error. Please know that if I could sit in front of anyone and teach this passage as dated, as intolerant, as now we know a better way, it would be a lot easier for me to do that. My message God's message is growing increasingly unpopular. But I will never teach what the Bible does not teach as truth. But let's finish the story. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile, this is so key, please get this verse, just as they did not think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. This is the truth of God's word. When we 
don't retain what God has taught us is true. We allow into our lives a darkness that will continue to multiply and grow and increase, and we will apply the same mistake in one area to multiple areas of sin. The eventual result of accepting sin and tolerating sin, refusing to acknowledge that God's word is true, even if the culture insists we believe something else. He makes a list of the darkness that infects the mind and the life of people who do not retain the knowledge of God as truth. We see envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. They know God's righteous decree, Paul says, that evil deserves death, but continue to do those very things and approve of those who practice them. If I could, I would have you hit pause on your computer and read and reread that list. It sounds frighteningly familiar right now. It is the result of tolerating sin and of altering God's truth to make it acceptable to sin in our world today. Not only acceptable, but praised in our world today. So Paul does hit the ground running and he hits it running hard. Why is that? Because Paul knows what hinders the gospel. Paul knows that if they don't get this right at the very beginning, that nothing else will matter. Paul knows that the very first step toward knowing God is repenting of the things that God doesn't want in our lives, the things God hates the biggest hindrance to gospel message has always been denying God's word is true and accepting sin in our lives as well as in the lives of others. I'm reading and have been reading since I've been working on the book of Romans, a book that was published in 2008 by Colin Murphy. It's titled, Are We Rome? Subtitle, the fall of an empire, and the fate of America. I agree with most all of it. So, are we Rome? The answer is yes. We always have been, and we always will be. We are Rome when we step away and don't treat God's word as truth. The Roman emperors denied the truth of God's word, and the empire fell as a result. I'll close with this. We had two presidents. They're 20 years apart. Please don't think I'm being political now. I just thought this was fascinating. Two quotes from two presidents. In the space of 20 years, America changed enough to allow a different way of thinking. President Reagan said, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. 20 years later, President Obama said, I will do everything that I can as long as I am president to remind the American people that we are one nation under God. And we may call that God different names, but we remain one nation.
Could we change so much in 20 years that we can agree with both of those presidents? Let me remind you once again of what the Apostle Paul said. This is the pure, holy truth of Scripture. Paul said, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, capital G, God, Jehovah God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. But before I go today, let me assure you that what I've just talked about is not just people who vote a certain way or people who live a certain way. Because we're going to expand on this next week. The truth is, in my adult life, for the last 40 years, I have seen the changes in our culture. And it is not for the better. I've seen the changes in the churches. Some are stronger. Some are coming back fully to adhere to every word of the Bible as the truth of God. But there are others that are adapting what they believe so that they can preach sermons that their people will come to hear. Has it been a while since you heard a sermon about the wrath of God, about the fact that God hates sin, about the fact that God turns people over to experience the consequences of depraved and foolish choices. For all of us, has it been a while since you watched TV and were offended that the people in front of you were not even close to married, and yet apparently living together, uh, having marital relations together? Are you worried about a child who thinks it's OK? I can say that it will be difficult to study the Book of Romans without having to first start with the areas of our own lives where we've come to tolerate and accept a behavior that God has always called sinful. Please, God, don't let us point fingers at some people's sin until we've really been honest about our own. Why is it important? It's the first thing Paul wants to talk about in this letter. To a church he wants to be certain is able to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. The first thing Paul does is says, think about what you're tolerating in your own life. And remember, God doesn't want you to. So. On that somber note, I ask you to take time to pray. God will tell you if there's an area of your thoughts, an area of your beliefs that you need to bow before God and yield to his truth and not our cultures. You can turn the computer off, but don't move until you've prayed. I'll see you next week.